We're going to wait a couple more minutes for the real surge of people, but I think it's only fair to reward you for being on time. Um, my name is John Kruger. I'm director of the almost Clinton County Historical Museum. It's in the process of its move. It's almost over, as many of you know. Uh, as of July 4th, when you're part of the parade over the Mayor's Cup festivities, please come by that afternoon. I have no real clear idea yet what you're going to see, but we'll be really happy to see you. It will be nice. We've got the one thing I've, that's really come home to me over the last five months and change is the incredible collection that this organization is the caretaker of. I mean, right now, to be honest, I wish it was a little less extensive than it is, but it, it's, a, it's a truly fine collection that covers, you know, from the very earliest, even pre-recorded history in this area, right up to almost yesterday. From textiles and Indian artifacts and firearms and farm implements, and more air base trophies than you could ever imagine ever existed in a lifetime. You name it, we've got it. Uh, parts of it will be on display at Three Cumberland. It's a smaller space, so we'll just change the displays more frequently. And once we get settled in, there's enormous opportunity for people to volunteer. Uh, somebody asked me a couple of minutes ago, I think it was Dick Ward, in fact, I know it was Dick Ward, if I knew where everything was. And since it was Dick Ward, I figured, you know, there was no point in making up an answer because he'd catch me anyhow. So I said, I think I know where most of the important things are, and everything else is more or less a gross sort by room. So that the textiles are all in one room. Most of the maps and documents are all in one room. I know for a fact that all the Indian artifacts are in a small closet. So there is some semblance of order. But for those of you with the time, energy, and inclination, <coughs> there's also a real opportunity. Because what I need are a lot of people that can come in sort of as self-starters, because I'm the whole staff, and take ownership of some of these areas, you know, and do a comprehensive inventory. Think out what sort of display we could do. I mean, it's, they're wonderful opportunities, but it's a lot more than I'm going to be able to do. So just sort of file that away in your idea book of, of projects you might want to take on or ways that you might possibly get involved. Okay, enough of the commercial announcement. A couple of more quick things, however. The next scheduled CCHA event is a week from this coming Saturday. It will be the first in our summer house tours. This is something that the organization did 10 or 11 years ago, and I think Kent DeLord has done it more recently. Uh, our first one consists of three beautiful homes in the Plattsburgh area. It's a week from Saturday, and anybody sitting in that back row knows more about it than I do, and they'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Fourth of July, 3 Cumberland Avenue, please show up. I'm going to bust my hump so that there's a display there for a couple of hours on one day. And if people don't show up, the next time we come together in a public meeting, I'm going to be extremely angry, and I promise to take it out on all of you. <laughs> Last announcement, but perhaps the most important. Second. We're going to have a really interesting talk in just a couple of minutes once I turn it over to Matt. And this is a standalone talk in its own right. But it's also sort of a tease for what's going to be a spectacular event next month. Friday, July 23rd, 
the Adirondack Hickory Open Golf 1916. For that morning, we're going to turn the clock back nearly 100 years. As many as people who can organize it will be in appropriate period costume. Uh, many of the clubs, and I'll, I'll say Matt knows a lot more about this than I do, but the cream of the Hickory Open Circuit will be here. It will be a lot of fun. I know squat about golf, and I'm planning on having a really good time because it'll be 1916. And for the morning, you can step back in time, and even if you don't play golf, it's a beautiful place, and there'll be lots of wonderful things going on. That was the end of the commercials. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to this evening's speaker, one of our trustees, uh, vintage golf enthusiast himself. Again, to tell you the truth, he's the reason we're happy. Marissa has a blank book back here. We're going to pass it around. If you could please sign in, it will demonstrate to the county that their money is well spent. Matt Dodds, ladies and gentlemen. It's interesting to me because I'm also an absolute golf addict. And uh, as I started to scratch the surface, I knew that there was golf up there and that it was a very old course. But as I got into it, I found out just how important it was and I got very excited about it. So I want to share that with you. Um, one thing that's so neat is we often have so much military history in this area. Um, and, but this Hotel Champlain really puts on a uh, pedestal, uh, cultural, um, political, and economic history up here at really a national level, which is kind of neat. I hope to touch on that a little bit. Um, of course, as an advertising person, I've always had a little bit of a, 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 a tangential relationship with facts. So now I'm going to be serving as a history person. It's my man, Paul. Um, so John in the back will be helping keeping me straight. And uh, I'd like to introduce Pat Kennedy at the back, who is a golf, fellow Golf Lecker Society member. Uh, he's come across the pond from Burlington, Vermont. He's brought several clubs. And uh, a, little bit, a little bit of interaction at the end. We're going to take out some of those clubs, and he'll be able to talk a little bit about the history of some of the equipment that was played around this area. Uh, I wanted to get into this with uh, get our mindsets back to the 1890s. Uh, particularly about the importance of the railroads that built uh, the Hotel Champlain. Then kind of funnel down into Bluff Point history. Go into the, a little bit of show and tell with the actual equipment itself. And then um, give you a very long ad for the Adirondack Hickory Open. All right, historical background. I'm going to do this as a quiz. I don't put anybody on the spot, but I always like these, so I thought I'd stop. Roll back the clock to 1870. Um, what do you think the life expectancy was? 45. 50. I like 45. 43.5, according to this book I was consulting with. But I tell you, you know, which means I only had two years to live for my 1870 self, and right now 60 is sounding very young to me. Um, how about another? What was your average income? Again, go to constant $19.89 and raise that figure in the back to uh, up. What do, you, what do you get? This is uh, your average income. This was hmm? in 1900. It was $4,778. So clearly, and if you look at a lot of the charts, so much of your income actually went towards uh, food. And there's a great migration from about 80% of people being farmers into finally having this kind of middle class occupations uh, uh, kind of come online. And that's all happening through the 1850s through the 1900s. You live in a house with four rooms. So statistically speaking, how many people 
are likely to be living in your house? Six. Well, four and a half. But if you count the rooms of your house, that's how likely you are to have family members. Quite a bit, quite a bit different from today. Uh, how likely are you in 1900 to live in a house with a flush toilet? Thirteen <laughs> percent. Now that goes up to thirty percent by 1930. We're starting to see electrification. You know, it's pre rated You know, a lot of things are going to come online. But uh, um, here's another one that I find. As I was reading, I was kind of getting shocked by these things, so I was pulling them out. What percentage of U.S. population is living east of the Mississippi? 70 percent. 90%. 90%. Wow. 90%. And uh, this is important, I think, for Plattsburgh. And the reason why it's important for Plattsburgh, it's one of the reasons why you have McKinley up here. It's one of the reasons why you have Taft up here, is I was looking back at the Electoral College and thinking about where all the big bodies are. There's Massachusetts, Ohio comes online, New York State particularly. And if you want to be President of the United States, you would, it would be wise for you to be touching base with the major cities in New York State. And I think that's a, a help me understand why some of that's happening. In fact, I was talking to John, uh, this book, How the West Was Won, uh, which was Teddy Roosevelt, the man of the title of that one, or Winning the West. Winning the West. Winning of the West. Um, when Theodore Roosevelt writes that book, he's talking about the West as in uh, Tennessee, the North, the North Kentucky, Illinois, all states east of the, of the Mississippi. So just to give you a sense of where the, the population is. And another thing is happening as the West, obviously, we have the land, but people haven't really been going out there so much. The last battle of the Sioux happened in 1890. Anyone want to venture what the name of that was? The Wounded Knee. In 1893, the U.S. had become the second largest world trader. Behind? England. That's right. So if, if you look at all these statistics, all these things that were, that were old world countries, England, France, Germany, the U.S. is start, starting to surpass. And uh, to the degree to which people have always kind of looked to Europe, um, suddenly America is becoming quite powerful right at this point of the third century. And I'll exit on this to talk about radio uh, 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 as a segue. What industry accounted for over 60% of all the issues on the New York Stock Exchange? What one industry? Railroad. <laughs> Railroads. <laughs> Railroads. Uh, and it, it, you know, you talk a lot about the internet, but I don't even think the internet age even touched. Uh, uh, the railroad and the, the kind of uh, change that that had for America. And that's important to us, and I apologize. Maybe Matt will hit the light. Uh, I apologize if this isn't clear. But in many ways, you can think of the Hotel Champlain as being built on rock. You can think of it being built on rock on that big bluff up there, which gives bluff point, but it's also built on rock, more specifically, anthracite because it was just coal mining interests in western Pennsylvania. They were looking here at New York State from across and down into Pennsylvania, which Massachusetts, and here's Vermont. Uh, down here, uh, the VH starts as a, um, a canal company transporting some of that anthracite, and then starts by leasing and acquiring, and as other railroads fail, it becomes more important and stitches this all together all the way up through. And Plattsburgh comes into the picture because Smith Weed is involved in some of these railroad activities, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. And the DNAH ultimately gets them to uh, come up and buy out that interest. However, this whole New York quarter, uh, it's very interesting reading. And there's a, there's a wonderful book which I'll hold up. It's this history of the Delaware and Hudson. Uh, tells a great story. In it, the New York side of the lake is held up because of the strength of the Central Vermont Railroad. So in many ways, it's really duplicating on the other side of the lake. And there's great kind of battles that go on for control. Uh, at some point, obviously, the original purpose was commercial. 
But as this new president comes on, the sixth president, Robert Bullock of the DNH, he wants to get more passenger traffic. And he's bringing people up from New York City, up to the Schenectady's and Albany's, and by this time we already have the Adirondacks having been developed. And he builds himself some hotels to do that. And one of his big pet projects was this Hotel Champlain up in Plattsburgh. Once this line gets uh, stitched together. And there it is, in the year 1888, Smith Weeds got this property that he I, apparently, according to uh, uh, Frank DeSorbo in the York State tradition, um, he has acquired for himself because it has that great lookout over the lake. He then um, uh, builds a big lookout tower for the people of Plattsburgh, builds some roads around it, so it is developed at, at a relatively early stage around the 1870s. But he ultimately convinced the DNH that this was going to be a great spot for a hotel. And the hotel is built after uh, the DNH challenges this people of Plattsburgh to say, okay, I'll kick in 150 if you guys kick in 20,000. And the town and Smith Weeds takes the lead on that, and they come for the money, and the capital is, is found. And the result is this great uh, hotel, Victorian, 500 rooms. There's a ballroom, there's a dining room, there's a billiard room, there's a bar, there's a cafe. And I think in a very kind of modern touch, there's a children's room and children's dining room separate from the regular dining room. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of nice. Uh, and it's the Peerless Adirondack and Lake Champlain Resort. And uh, I'll pass around a, um, a book that I have I've been able to collect and eBay's wonderful for this, a series of the early advertising, um, often in Harper's or Scribner's magazines. And if you start here, you can kind of take a look through. Notice as you get from the 1890s, particularly around 1896, when the hotel builds a nine-hole golf course, golf suddenly becomes a very big part of the cell. And that reflects a little bit because in 1888, something else is happening which is that golf is becoming really popular. Um, it, and the old world, in parts of France and in Scotland, is connected to it. Uh, it's already been a little bit uh, coming along. But in 1888, there is a thing called the Apple Tree Game, which are railroad executives, big kind of barren types down in New York City, including Andrew Carnegie, uh, playing golf. And it's unclear right now whether uh, Olafet was part of that. I'm trying to do some of the research to see if I can look at the DNH board and compare that back to the apple tree game or maybe some of what's happening on Long, Long Island and Shinnecock Hills. But it's still a work in progress to try and see exactly why it is that way up here in the, the Adirondacks we have this uh, golf getting started. And there's some speculation that because Montreal in 1873 has a course that uh, there may also be some correspondence with Montreal. And here's uh, Robert Bullifant, um, who heads the DNH from 1884 to 1903. And he largely, it's his vision and his pet talk project to come on out and to develop this. And I just love some of the old photographs. You can get to this by rail. But the DNH not only had rail uh, ownership, it also owned the uh, sea passages and all these steamers that came through. And there was a little spit of land that came on out. We'll see this in other photographs uh, where the steamers landed. There must have been a really grand way to, to enter into Plattsburgh. I think it talks to the clout of the railroads as well that um, at this time, uh, the Harper's Magazine actually features the hotel is only in its uh, second month of operation, and there's a cover story, uh, August 16, 1890. That's kind of a, we'll pass this from the collection. The,
as as this relates to gold, and the next picture as it's coming up and for there we go. Um, much of the land was dynamited and moved by force. Again, you're in 1890, so you imagine the kind of um, uh, uh, landscaping and shaping you're around the time of Fred Paul Homestead going to uh, New York City. Uh, and the landscaping is really great. There's a thousand acres. And a big feature, and I'll, I'll, we'll show a little bit more of this on the back, was this green drive. And there's 450 acres that were really manicured very well. Um, and people would ride through them. Here you can see the hotel. This was five stories, the middle layer. And uh, the, there's some stunning Library of Congress pictures of panoramic as, panoramic as you look through. Here, I believe, is a stagecoach. This might, I believe, because it's coming in from this side, this would be from the, uh, the, the railroad station. People would hop on the carriage and then come on up. Uh, there is a separate road, and I think these horses would be faced the other way if they were coming up from the uh, water. But you also see some of these cottages. Now, I was looking at photographs to try and match them. Uh, I, right now, assuming that this is the southern salient of the hotel, uh, I don't believe that either of these two exist anymore. Because this looks like, I think, where the Stafford Center is now. Mm -hmm. And some of this is parking down across. But I believe this one is. Mm -hmm. And this is this is near where the child care center, I believe the McKinley Cottage. Mm -hmm. But I, again, I'm trying to find through documents the actual order of these cottages, et cetera. It's a little tough to, to find. Um, a real highlight is we're now, um, we built this hotel in 1890. There was an, a, there was an addition added on in 1892. It was so successful, but that extra 100 rooms were built. And by 1897, they actually have a sitting president, uh, Wayne McKinley, come on up. And there's some interesting stories behind this. Uh, she is not pictured, but uh, uh, McKinley's wife, Ida, was an epileptic. And um, in much of the correspondence, it looks uh, as if Wayne was very concerned about his wife. It was a very loving relationship. And he wanted to take her to a place that was healthy. And that was one of the considerations for bringing her up. You see, this man here is Derek Hobart. This is his wife. And the man right back here, this is Smith Lee. Uh, clearly a, a player and uh, hosts a big banquet at the Bouquet House uh, when they come, come on up. Here's uh, McKinley in front of the hotel. Uh, this is the 26th infantry. Uh, again, because there is barracks in uh, Plattsburgh and it is the largest deployment um, uh, military in, uh, uh, in the East, you also have access to these kind of cotillions dances, to uh, the bands <coughs> playing outside. Uh, you go down and watch the military parades be conducted. As if you were of high society at this time, uh, you might have your sons or daughters, or, or rather your sons, in the military. Uh, as apparently a great favorite. Uh, and there's some interesting stories associated with McKinley, who apparently was a very uh, plain guy. Uh, the story is that when he signs the register, he signs as Mr. and Mrs. William McKinley from Ohio. <laughs> 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 He's the city U.S. president. That's great. <laughs> He's a plain guy, and, he, and I guess Hobart's golf nut, and he said, William, why don't you come on down and try uh, swing some golf? Uh, clubs and apparently he gives it a try, but he finds being under this one tree more relaxing. And there's a, a rather famous tree along this green drive. The green drive kind of went all the way around. There was a gun club, there was a bowling alley, there's all these little things set out. And if you go through some of this area, you can still find some of the old gazebos and pavilions, uh, kind of just rotting away in the middle of the of the woods. And it'd be a really neat tour at some point to go back through. Uh, but apparently he was very much taken by this. And I just went out yesterday 
And I don't know if as you go up to Clinton County, uh, Clinton Community College, and you swing around to the right, do you know there's that uh, soccer field? And then there's a softball field. And if you look in the far, if you look to the south, in the softball field, you will see this. And this is how you used to get down to the golf um, uh, uh, club, the golf course. And here is the green uh, drive. And what we hope to do is open this up again in a way it hasn't been in 40 years. Matt Booth's got a brush hog, and Mike, uh, Mike's got a uh, chainsaw. There's Mike. And we're just going to go through here and trim this up a bit so that we can get some golf carts going up through here and reconnect this old hotel with its uh, golf course. And as you go through, you end up here. And this is the McKinley Monument right here, next to my children, or on the right, and a million. It's going to be on the hometown table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where is that? And this is, okay, now, if this is the 18th green in the background. You're driving up from Route 9, mm -hmm. and on your right is the 18th. You've just passed by the 17th, <coughs> and you're going up to the course. Right here, you'll see this stump. And it's just a crime. It's just a crime. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a picture of it in better form a little bit later, hopefully. Um, but it was a funerary urn on top of a monument with a plaque. And we have been trying to find out what that plaque said, but it said something to the effect that here was the, stood the tree that uh, is called the McKinley Pine that uh, President McKinley used to rest under. This was erected, of course, in 1901, he was assassinated in Buffalo by this anarchist. John Wood's got a name. Leon, and then it had a whole lot of consonants. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Carter. Carter. Yeah, it sounds good to do. Yeah, it starts with a C. You let it see. Yeah, you let it see kind of often in the uh, pavilion there. In the, uh, and interestingly enough, for the Adirondacks, this is how Teddy Roosevelt becomes president, and he's in the Adirondacks at the time. The DNH is connected to this because they have to get him down to Washington. Uh, and there's all kind of neat stories about him going down by buckboard in the middle of the night, and getting telegrams at different stations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, interesting. We're doing the move from uh, 48 Court down to Staley. And I've been bugging everyone to say, keep your eye out for Hotel Champlain stuff. You never know what's going to fall out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Paul LaDuke is hauling a box and says, Matt, you know, I see something with Bluff Point on it. And I'm like, okay. And we open it up. And what's really neat about this is this is the location plan. And we don't know, you know, how long this has been in a box, but this underscores the, 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 lovely, the lovely collection that we've got. This is the site plan. Uh, a couple things to point out. Here's your route nine. Here, you go down. I don't know if you, you can see it, but <coughs> there's rumors that this station will start up again for Clinton Community College. Have you heard that? No. Yeah? I've heard the rumors. Okay, well, there's a rumor, so we can start it. But apparently, they're making enough traffic to be able to start this up again as a stop because of the increasing student enrollment. Um, but here you, you see, uh, going across here, here's your um, uh, uh, drive on the way up to the oval in front of the hotel. Here's the 100 room annex, which means this, this dates this map, in my opinion, to 1892. Uh, it's or later, and it must be before 1897, because that's when the golf uh, course gets expanded. I'll do a little bit of a blow up on this area. Is a monument on it? No, because 19, he's not assassinated until 1901. And the monument comes after the assassination. Um, but I want to toggle back and forth between these two pictures. And what I want you to keep an eye on is this little shape over here. Okay, and this is a little um, uh, um, prominence going out into the lake. And this is here's the route nine again, and the, the train station, the track would be down here. Um, this, a lot of this land was purchased later, was farmland, to expand to allow this course to get um, uh, done. The course was ashamed a bit because in 1911, even after they had expanded the course, they had the guys, and I think it was probably the USGA, just listed as the, the national 
um, uh, uh, golf organization was to come up to bet the course to see if they could play the championship that year. And uh, apparently, there are so many crossing holes, and this is quite common in the Scottish golf, that it was considered too dangerous. And uh, some of the early write-ups are really quite funny. It was talking about guys uh, swooning into women's arms because of getting hit on the head, etc. And it's quite a dangerous sport, you know? Uh, but, uh, so, uh, the course gets a major overhaul in 1911. What you're seeing right now, mostly, however, is 1913. And this is when A.W. Tillinghast, who's really very, very famous within the golfing world, uh, comes on up. And there's uh, any number of, of he was a prolific writer, he used to write golf magazines, and any number of articles actually feature some of the things that uh, uh, his reminiscences, and including uh, building this course. Now, let's see if I can, sorry, to your, uh, interestingly enough, here's the bowling alley, somewhere around the staff, the Stafford Center is now. Um, there's the Gun Club, and these all have these bucolic names like the Cedar Grove here. I don't know if there's still cedars over there. Um, there's a Gun Club, a shooting area, etc. But the important thing for this particular map, as far as the USGA is concerned, which is very nice, is that this uh, says Golf Link. I usually say Golf Links, so I don't know if that means is there one hole, one uh, hole. Usually there'd be three. And looking at the space, what's important about this is even um, as, and this is of course information after Herman Doe has written his book, he was speculating that many of the early holes were down by the lake. But this is really great documentary evidence showing that the 15th, 16th, and 17th holes, when you play on them, are some of the oldest uh, holes in America. I don't think there's more than 24 built at this time, so almost all courses were three or six. This time wasn't until uh, 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 much later in the 1890s that uh, Chicago built the first 18 golf course. course. Okay. And of course, the crime is that this map is not dated. <laughs> they were <laughs> crawling all over it to find the date, but we have to back into it through the uh, architecture. Some of the early uh, golf uh, photographs, and now we're getting into the, the golf section are interesting. This is um, uh, O.D. Seavey, who was the manager at the, the hotel. He was also the person in the off season. He would be down in New York City and he would be passing out brochures. And um, Andrew, you know, I throw his name every once in a while at the E day to see what came, comes up. And uh, through that method, I found out that he was down in Lenox, Massachusetts, and so of course is after that. What you're seeing here is you're seeing this um, a sand tee, and that the teeing areas were made of sand in those days, and dirt. And, uh, and this in all likelihood is a splice neck uh, golf club. And what's really kind of neat, and you, it puts this all in perspective, is this course is made before the use of wooden tees. This course predates the use of the word par. Uh, bogey was the original uh, name for it, and um, um, that's kind of that's kind of telling. I think. Here are some early photographs, probably around 1900, 1902. They come in a promotional book in 1903. Some guys playing out in the evening. Here's uh, the original clubhouse, which stands just behind. You know where the putting green is? On the 18th, separates the 18th uh, green from the clubhouse. Um, that's where this was. It was uh, burned down intentionally, and intentionally, I believe it was in the 70s, 1970. And I, you know, I, I just loved golfing attire, <laughs> which was uh, pretty much what you were wearing, I guess. You got your tie on, you get a straw boater, you get your hat, you know, you can get really crazy, you might put little uh, knickers on there, but uh, not necessarily. But it was quite a gentleman's sport and uh, obviously a good match going on. Now, why is it that this golf goes crazy in the States? Uh, it has a lot to do with this itinerary professional by the name of Harry Gordon. Um, captured the imagination of people. Obviously, there was a lot of people of Irish, Scottish uh, heritage. He was Scottish. Um, 
and came across and was just an absolute master of the game. People would come out and watch him play. Uh, uh, he was part of what was called the Great Triumvirate. Pat's going to have to help me out. Let's see, there's James Baird, James Braid, Harry Ball, Harry Barton, and Ray, and Ray, Ted Ray. And uh, Ray actually accompanied him. And I was going through the paperwork to see if actually uh, Barton played on the course. He didn't, but he did a week and a half down at Blue Mountain Lake. And there's a he played a match against Gillespie, and there was clearly some Gillespies up here who were like the club pros. And I think they may have, you know, people may have hopped on a train and gone down and played it. Uh, but he did extremely well. And I can't uh, leave out another president. I, 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 before I decide, I gotta get, let's go back to McKinley a bit, because I want to close out on him. It's not only important that McKinley came on up, but if you, if you know that he came up in 1897, and then McKinley came back in 18. 89. There was that one year in 1898 that he didn't come on up, and that was the year of the Spanish-American War. And it was a really a great turning point in the American politics because there was almost the frontier expanding up until the 1890s. But once you had California in place, uh, it really went to American empire. And we started to get Guam and the Philippines, and we started to have the great white navy that went around, and uh, certainly uh, um, this gentleman, Howard Taft, was the first governor of the Philippines. Uh, so uh, that became via that route. And of course, was handpicked by Roosevelt uh, to be the next president after he had done his two terms. Uh, so here's Taft coming up for 1909 as the centennial for the, the celebration of the discovery of Lake Champlain. <coughs> and here he is on the military barracks. And here's my oh. open window saying I'm very show very short of system. Uh, okay. oh. If you see smoke coming from the top of the machine. Let's see if I can ignore that go on. But I, I think uh, what I what I want to say uh, <laughs> 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 I wanna say Taft was a big golfer. <laughs> 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 If you could really get weight transferred, huh? <laughs> apparently, he was a talented, pretty athletic guy, and uh, could really hit him out. And there's some great stories about you know, him putting the ball out there, and God bless him, he needed the exercise, I guess. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it wasn't exactly a tennis <coughs> kind of type, but you know, he swung the hickories. And uh, here you are. This would be a sand tea box where you'd have some water and some sand, and you'd mix them together, and you'd make your sand tea, and I, uh, Pat, you, you can show us one of those later? Sure. Oh, great. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's worth for every man here. Let's see if I can uh, push on through. There's Teddy at the barracks. <laughs> this is, you know, now he's been, he's the thing, the rough rider of San Juan Hill charging on up. And I'm sure this uh, distinguished man on the right, you know, a lot of the old soldiers, they love McKinley. They were quite wary, wary of Roosevelt, who's a little bit of a, you know, upstart young punk. Uh, a lot of the old guys who fought in the Civil War felt that they had fought to preserve the Union and that it wasn't desirable to go out for find, to fight foreign wars. They didn't have the ambition for America to be an imperial power. So very interesting dynamic between um, McKinley and Roosevelt, and I'm sure, given the fact that it's a military base, that's kind of interesting. Uh, the person who throws the big uh, celebration when Pat comes up is Governor Sherman's <coughs> on the left, who was a um, uh, candidate for presidency. Um, <coughs> defeated by Wilson, <coughs> yeah, in uh, 1913. Excuse me, what was his name? Governor Hughes. 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 Charles Evans Hughes. And later goes on to a very distinguished career in uh, the court at The Hague, the 
talking about the creation of the first League of Nations law, kind of international court. <laughs> but here's some sort of great uh, golf wear, I think. No one could wear that. The open. Here we see the same scene today. <laughs> it seems a little uh, anticlimactic to have that uh, you know, walled off like that, I mean, especially when you can kind of go down and obviously uh, enjoy it so much. Well, something happens in 1910. The whole thing burns down. The press Republican says maybe it was rats gnawing on matches. <laughs> but, uh, Luckily enough, they have another hotel for William Henry. They got the plans all set, and this thing burns down. Boom! Next year they got it up. Uh, 1911 it reopens. For that one year, 1910, they uh, they have a little uh, uh, cottage community. But uh, here, you know, much much as it is today, and here they are playing a little golf. Here she's got her uh, you know mashie out, and there was a little. Uh, well, that's that's the first woman that I've seen so far golfing. Is that about when women started golfing? Or? I, you know what? Women were golfing pretty much all along. Oh, and it, it's surprising if you look through. I mean, the, they weren't in numbers as great, but they were a constant presence. And they'd often played what this is called court golf. They wouldn't necessarily go on to the main one, but there would often be like pitching putt courses. Called, uh, and this is where either if you're a guy, you kind of warm up or just learn the game. And ladies would often play through here. But it was not considered woman-like to raise your arms above your shoulders and really give it a slap. So it was kind of even more. Probably was ladylike though to catch the ball with your skirt raised. <laughs> <laughs> but this is I mean, this is tennis court, obviously. And here we're from uh, there's also a croquet court out front. Uh, I wanted to throw this in here. Apparently at the bar was Bud Fisher, and he's doing all these cartoons over here. And there's a feature, many of them featured uh, um, a Plattsburgh, and two shirkers from the military who would, uh, would leave the barracks and go up at the bar at the Hotel Champlain. And the guy who ran the hotel was said he got hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of uh, advertising off the Bud Fisher cartoons. And this was a Hearst pub publication. Um, Hearst was up for William Miranda Hearst, and later his mistress. There's all these things, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That's 1925. I talked about that expansion a lot. See, this year, if we went back to the old map, a lot of this was the original. This farmland was purchased as well as some across the street. And that allowed the current layout, more or less, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then so on across the back. There's George Merritt, pretty smart. Ready to smack the ball. He's done the redo in 1911. <coughs> However, his redo was short lived because Tilneas came in two years later. Here's some more ladies on the course. In this case, um, I believe this is clock golf. And what you do is you'd, you'd have this, uh, in fact, um, Mark Denord has got the old uh, Roman numerals that would go around the Outside, it would be one, two, three, right through twelve, and it would be a hole. You know where you want, where you wind the clock? They put the hole in that position, and then as you went around, you would have to have some short putts, and then they go a little longer, then they get short again, and you'd have to go put around in the shortest number of strokes. Uh, but that, you know, and the precise putting green that you can put on today was the same one that that did this, and. Um, it was interesting how I came out there because I was talking to the historian of the USGA to get some of the history. They said clock golf, and I had to go through and figure out what clock golf was, and there's all kinds of neat things. Here's A.W. Tillinghast. Allow me, if you will, to uh, tell you a little about what he, what he said in uh, one of his articles about coming up to Plattsburgh. He says, a, a few years back, I was retained to make plans for the reconstruction of the course of Love Point, Lake Champlain. Already I had made a preliminary visit, and as my report was favored, uh, instructions were given to prepare definite plans. It was late in the fall, and already the large hotel, the large resort hotel there was closed. Indeed, the trains had discontinued stopping at Bluff Point for that season. The nearest point was Plattsburgh, New York. My departure had been so hasty that I did not have time to summon my regular engineer, and really I was wondering what to do. However, I took the chance of calling in some local surveyor. 
It so happened that the train slowed up for some reason or another just as we came to the golf course, which was hard by the tracks. If you think of, I guess it's 16 this one here. Um, anyway, I, I seized the opportunity, threw out my bag, and jumped off. For the speed of the train was not great. There was the course all around literally congested with engineers and transits. It happened that my the engineering corps from the Army training post at Plattsburgh had selected this morning for and the spot for practice. They might just as well practice on a golf course as anything else. And by this uncanny stroke of good fortune, it was possible to return to New York that same night with all the data that was necessary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was a lot cheaper too. I wonder if he, uh, if he uh, sent him a bill for less. Here's uh, Walter Hagen in 1914, and he beat up a bit by the 20s. He was quite successful. Uh, but I like to show this because there's an interesting dynamic about class in golf, um, in that golfing professionals were considered to be, you know, a blow esteem. These were the kind of German people, and they weren't often fit to go into clubhouses. Uh, and the big thing was the U.S. amateur. You wanted to be the dilettante amateur, and the, the low-life guy who was like the Scots that came over the, across the pond and like you know taught you. Well, that was one thing, but you know if you're a person of position, you know you want to not take any money for winnings. And so um, this was the first person to say, "Hey, I'm going to the clubhouse." Walked right in and uh, over at St. Andrews, caused a big stir, uh, and refused to be a second-class citizen. And it was quite flamboyant, wore these great clothes, and strutted about. And, uh, pretty much was well liked guy and kind of broke that mold and uh, uh, certainly had a lot to do with golf. In those days, you'd have tees and they'd have advertising on them, doers, whatever. And, you know, you, they they pay him to take the tee after he hit and, and scatter them on the ground. And of course, all the kids and people would go pick them up as souvenirs. You know, like sports sponsorship. And all the Sarah's been playing any number of greats came through, and I'll. A couple here, Babe Ruth came up to play, some great stories about him. Uh, one apocryphal story about how he was on the first tee and he did it in the lake. It's a little hard to believe, I'm not sure that's right, but uh, uh, apparently on a practice round, he did shoot a 69 before this tournament, which was one off the course record. It's very accomplished. This is one year after he retired. Um, I think we're at uh, 33. Here, this gentleman here, Craig Woods, another person from the Adirondacks down on Lake Placid, uh, hugging on to a trophy nearly. The U.S. Open won that. He also won uh, the Masters that year. And he had this 10 year hiatus, 1930 to 1941, when he was called number two Wood because he'd always finished second. And if you know about Mickelson this year, uh, had the big hair shirt, and all the guys saying, when are you going to actually turn it? Well, he finally did. And, uh, he was born and raised right here in uh, the Adirondacks. It's a great story. Let me do this. Let me uh, turn on the lights and turn it over. We're going to look at some clubs for a bit. That's all right. And I'll introduce you to Pat Kennedy and maybe uh, open up for a little questions about uh, some of the equipment. It's very interesting how the interplay between how courses change course management change and now that uh, the ball changed, now the old equipment changes in response. I brought a few. Some of the, the very, well, the, the very first club had smooth, or called smooth face. They didn't have any grooves that you find in the, in the modern club. And the shafts are all hickory. Hickory didn't become the standard until about 1850, and it was sort of an accidental uh, concept in that hickory, and both persimmon, really came from the U.S. Uh, the hickory, as most of the trade was from England to the U.S., and, there, and a lot of the ships basically were going back empty. But they had to have ballast. And the hickory logs or anything of weight was put into the ships and then when they got to Scotland would get dumped out, sometimes used and sometimes not. 
and a lot of the early or used were thornwood, apple, beech, some of the native woods of, of Scotland. And several, some club makers were, ran out of wood and they happened to come across these hickory logs, tried them, and it was a far superior wood than they've ever had been using. So hickory becomes, gradually becomes the sort of the standard. And most of the hickory all was coming from Kentucky. Were the hickories always dark brown? No, because this, this is a sort of a stain. It'll vary because what they would, and, the, and you can always tell a poor hickory from a, from a from a good one. So, in around about the 1925 to 1930s, you start getting a lot of sort of cheap hickory shafts, and you can usually tell them because they're very rough. And one of the steps that the, the old club makers used was when they finished this down and it was done, they would take and wet it, which would bring up the grain again, and then sand it back down again. And that was when that step's cut out, and going through a few years of moisture, that grain will all pop up again. And it'll be rough. And they also took asphaltum and some linseed oil, turpentine, and had their mixture that they would rub on this. And you'll get the different colors. You know, they from that to looks like that, you know. So the color is probably more of a signature of the of the shop or the club maker. Uh, so that they can probably tell their clubs from somebody else's. And they often order up the club heads from Scotland. Is that right? Right. A lot, most of a lot of the heads came to this country as just heads. And. Uh, I think it was some uh, collector in the Goth Collector Society found a bill of lading from a sh shipping company that, and that the golf club had to come through listed as farm implements. You <laughs> 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 seldom, if ever, find you know, these bill of lading saying golf club heads, <laughs> which may be the reason that they if there was a tax on it, nobody knew exactly what to call it. <laughs> they came through as farm implements. <laughs> um, but these are all either are, are forged, either a great deal of the work is done by by hand or and they were still called hand forged even when they used a drop forge, which had a pattern and the the original shape would be done in sort of a in a mold, and then a lot of handwork on it to get the, the shape. I'll pass these around. What's the metal? The metal is just a carbon steel. Carbon steel. Is, is it the hickory? Is it is it because it's very hard, or because it has some kind of spring? It's the flexibility, yeah, and the, and the durability, and the grain was always positioned so it was going laterally. You had it this way, it, would, it wouldn't last. Yeah, like a baseball bat. Like a big, same thing as a baseball bat, where the, with the trademark. Mm -hmm. And you said with, as the years go by, with the moisture, the grain would come back up. I imagine that would happen again when the not, owner had not, not with the really good ones. No. This one. Because I wondered if that was part of the upkeep. You had to well, the probably upkeep down. was keeping them straight. And that's, that's the, the big, you know, I mean, most of these will have and there's a way of heating them, putting linseed oil on here, and you can get them back straight again. But, uh, so you more or less have to depend on the pro to do that for you? Or the, right, or the golfers that were avid, new, you know, or, I mean, if I get one that's really crooked and I want to get it straight, just some, using one of those can of Cerno and some linseed oil, and you gradually that work it. That's a winner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, then you may have to put it in a vice and plant it yeah. so that it's your big, you know. Otherwise, and then time is going to go back to the way it was when you found it. 
Interestingly enough, golf was a lot longer a sport. There's lots of pictures of the old days in uh, Hotel Champlain where people were using black or red balls to play in the snow. So, like February, so like, okay, let's get out the snow. Now this is an example of a smooth base. And this would be before 1900. Now what about the weight possible in the clubs that you have now? The weight is the major. Here's a, this is a five iron head or a mashie head. This is probably about 1920, 1920s, 25. And here's a head that was made just, it's a modern. <laughs> Those heads weigh exactly the same thing. The weight on the head. And in a set of golf clubs, <coughs> as you go from a three iron down, it goes three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine on down. Each head's getting about a quarter of an ounce heavier, about seven grams heavier. And that's still a new fact probably in the 1920s for that period. The weights have been figured out. They haven't changed. You know, there's about 258 grams. Every five iron head that's ever been made that's being made today weighs 200. 58 grams, which means they can change this shape a little, but they can't make it twice as big without finding some place to extract metal and move it around. That's, those are what they are. What about Big Bertha? How Big Bertha, the driver head weighs about 200 grams. Big Bertha weighs 200 grams. It's just the shape. The same is the shape and the introduction of different methods of forming that metal. So that it'll, because the USDA just passed the rule on how big a head you get. And probably 10 years ago, it was not a concern. They figured that the heads could not get much bigger than they were because they tried to make them bigger. The metal would the ball would cause the head to collapse. So there was, but now they, they came up with new ways of forging new concepts. And so you thought here would be a mailbox. Yeah. But, you know. I don't have one, by the way. I don't have a big birthday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that, that driver head, and there was one reason for, for persimmon that came up very popular wood for the club head. And the persimmon was an ideal club weight in order to get around this 200 grams of weight. And people have tried teak and a lot of these other woods that are harder, but to get the weight down to, to the weight of this head, we had to cut away so much <coughs> of the wood that it would not withstand the, the blow of a golf ball. And, and you know, going, all these need to uh, put the water because of grass eats. And that, that's like two woods. It's got its name from the quiet grass plate. And, you know, this would be the driver or a play club. And it usually had a piece of horn, or, or in this case, this is a synthetic type of material made out of linen and asphalt like an early plastic. And this was your driving club. And this is what you hit the ball off that little pile of sand. So there was less chance of damaging a piece of horn or the bottom of the club. But this club, these clubs were used out in the uh, fairway. <coughs> and there was always the chance of hitting rocks. So the idea of putting this brass plate on the bottom was originally to protect this horn that was in there. And that and hence the name Brassy. And that was an addition because there was some point where people were trying to use these off the fairway and we ended up damaging the club. So there was that introduction of 
another socket there. Right, and on the wood, the way this head is attached, is there's a scare or a scarf joint, and this is glued together and cut at an angle. And then the, the whipping on here is protected, but you can look at this, on this one, you can see where the scare starts and finishes up here. And then about 1900, the concept of putting a, a hole in here on the having a socket, which this is sort of a transition club. This is a socket, but it looks in profile very much like the stair head. There are, you know, it's almost identical in the, in the shape. So when this, this type of, of way of combining the, the shaft and the head came about. Uh, clubs were much stronger. And easier to make. And a lot of, the, a lot of these heads became made on copy, mold, copy mold machines. And one of the big companies that, that it was McGregor, which originally made shoe last, they made bowling pins, Made, made that, took that same technology and started making golf club heads. In fact, they were making golf club heads for export before they were making complete golf clubs. So a lot of the sort of rare clubs that, are, that were coming or being sought after that were made in Scotland, the heads were most likely made in the U.S. and shipped back to Scotland, and then they, because it was so much easier, rather than carving this whole head out, one at a time. Yeah, because the clubs look so different, were the balls different? That you would find them in this era? Right, these would have been the, the gutty percha, or the gutties. In fact, a lot of these, before this, these heads would have been much longer, and that's when the feathering. And they were these were long nose, and as the gutty came in, around, it was around 1850 that the gutty started. So they had the the well, it was a solid. Well, the feathery was the leather outside with feathers. Yeah. feathers. Yeah. You take, take, take about top hat of feathers, and they were boiled, stuffed into the ball, and the. The leather was soaked in alum, and it was wet. So the combination of the wet feathers and the wet leather, as the weather, leather dried, it shrank, and as the feathers dried, it, they expanded. So the combination of the feathers expanding and the leather, you got a very hard, and it's, it's as a very hard sound. It sounds not much different than dropping a regular golf ball. Table. It has a very, it's not a soft. Was it was it lighter than the golf balls we had? Yeah. Well, there was no there was no standing on what the weight would be. So they, while the feathers will have the, the weight, people will have a choice as to what they played with, and the the standard. Did I'm not just sure when the USGA set the standard of 1.86 ounces. In fact, even in 1950, when they were got together to try and standardize the uh, European through the San Andreas and the USGA, they still left that the size of the ball out was 1.68, right. and mm -hmm. so yeah. it's relatively recently. In Scotland, their, their golf balls were always smaller, mainly because the grass was shorter and they had the wind, and they didn't want to give up that advantage of a smaller ball going through the wind. And they wanted a ball that was set up more on the grass because their grass is traditionally much shorter. Where the our ball behaves in most of the early uh, golfers going from this country playing the British Open, most for a while would always play with the smaller Scottish ball 
not wanting to be at a disadvantage. No, but, uh, I'll pass these around or you can walk. This particular one, this has an ivory insert, which was very popular in the 20s. You know, and right after the smooth face, then they began putting punch marks and dashes and dot, you know, or in the belief that it would give you more uh, backspin. But in reality, it, it didn't, it, it doesn't give you any more. If the golf balls got harder, that nose started to get shorter and shorter and shorter until you get the modern sort of shape of, of the one with the ivory in it, which is fairly standard. And that was a gradual that sort of an evolution that took place because of what the golf ball was doing to the plus putting the insert. The insert, the early play clubs, that were like this, this was the new weather. Yeah, it's like good. We, it's the old brassy. Yeah. The person who would use wood clubs like that, would that be a disadvantage now? I mean, would the, the newer clubs be considered? A little bit, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's the ball that's changed and the condition of the course. Um, those clubs will hit a ball just this far. And, you know, most, a lot of the modern clubs are. <coughs> Are a couple of inches longer, so you know you get more centrifugal force, and that's giving you more distance. <coughs> and you know they would still, if you could, have, if you could, have, if those would have stayed straight, uh, and it didn't, you know, you take those out on a real wet and rainy day, the club's picking up weight, it's changing, the weight's changing, so it's not going to play the same. The dry wheat or the wood on the wet wheat. But keeping them. And the, go the golf ball today, uh, you know, up until the modern one golf ball, if you hit the golf ball on the. If you missed the insert and hit it out on the toe, the ball always got a cut in it. That doesn't happen today. With the, with the modern ball, what you do is you end up crushing the wood on the toe, and after a season of golf, uh, that wood just starts coming up, falling apart. Hmm. So the metal woods have come about largely because of of the change in the golf ball. Because they, you can still buy persimmon woods, but nobody. There's no advantage, you know, because if you don't hit it on the sweet spot every time, the ball is going to take its toll on the club. <coughs> now, irons haven't changed. Uh, you know, the thing that's changed is the technology in, in knowing where the center of gravity of this club is in relation to where the center of gravity of the golf ball. And a lot of these, some of these early clubs, they didn't know quite where the center of gravity was. So you'll find a lot of clubs where the center of gravity is either at the same height as the center of gravity of the golf ball or even above it, which makes it difficult to get the ball airborne. And most of the clubs that you see, the, that, the shiny head that's going around that has the cavity back, uh, oh, yeah. Is an example of a hand that's designed to help get the ball airborne, where this one is not necessarily designed to do that, although it does have a bit of a bulge in the back. So. Here's an early, this is an early type of putter that's sort of a long nose. This would have been played with in the feathery 
period. And then here's a putter that's connected in your this is a Schenectady putter, which was a famous early putter. It's, it was attributed with the uh, Royal Ancient banning center shafted or putters, but uh, there is some to refute that, that it was just something that the Royal Ancient did and had nothing to do with the fact that uh, the weight is the same, though, is what we use. Uh, pr probably pretty much, yeah. But this is like an aluminum. Yeah, it's an aluminum head, oh. so it's actually lighter. That's, why, that's why it's big. Yeah, right. It but the thing here is the center shaft, and there are no rules on a putter declaring where this shaft can go into the head. On the, on the other clubs, there are rules that govern You know, on Ironhead, this shaft could not be coming into there. It has to be, you know, it's something like three eighths, less than, you know, like three eighths of an inch. You could have a, in a little bit, but not very little. Uh, a 96, 
Uh, it is a set of clubs that I had never played with before. I shot a 52 on the front nine, and I shot a 44 on the back nine. And I birdied the 18. <laughs> Driver, brassy, speed, um, uh, uh, speed, uh, speed, speed magic, and a putt. And it just, you know, feels like whoa, 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 this really big. There's, you're much more intimate with the clubs than you are with these modern technology. We have to clean up the green drive. If you want to help us, that would be great. It looks like someone's taking a chance to dump their uh, sink. I'm not sure. Elephant's that in there. If you want to help us do that, that would be great. We've been able to obtain an actual scorecard from the 1916. We know all the original yardages. Notice that this is marked in bogeys. Uh, here's your hand. This, is, this card is six inches long. And I got calling trying to figure out why uh, with the USGA this gold house down there, great historians helping out. And uh, it has to do with signings. Uh, 1916, by this time, if you would use your card as a measuring device if your opponent ball one of the ball was within six inches of yours or within six inches of the cup, you could have them remove that. Everything else, tough luck, you get a putt around. Um, and uh, we've even got a movie by the name of Janice Meredith that was um, shot. I don't know if you saw that in that little booklet that was passed around. There's a little flyer for it. But on site in 1925, a movie was shot in Plattsburgh. Um, and parts of it have to do with the Revolutionary War, and there's a scene of the Washington crossing of the Saranac, I mean, <laughs> Delaware. <laughs> they used all these uh, troops as extras. Uh, so if you're into it, it's, it's, a, it's 156 minutes. It's not for the faint of heart. Two hours of rip-roaring silence. <laughs> you know, sound underneath. Starring none other than uh, Mary Marion Davis, who is uh, uh, William Hint, Randolph Hearst's uh, celebrated mistress, who is up here, was staying at the hotel. W. C. Fields is also in it, although in a younger day. Uh, we'll have this playing in the Savage Center after uh, the morning of golf. That should be a lot of fun. Um, thank you for your time. We'd love to be able to have everybody come on out, and uh, we'll have. Uh, you know, music going and uh, raise funds critically for the Clinton County Historical Association to John's point. Gosh, we need scanners, we need to catalog stuff, we need computers, just all sorts of things. And uh, if you can have a good time and uh, raise some money at the same time, that would be great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take a look at the clubs more. <laughs>